Uh, welcome to the sessions on uh, e-sikshna of uh, VTU. So we will proceed with our uh, uh, talks on uh, power quality. So in the last class, we discussed uh, issues of long duration and short duration voltage variations. So long duration and short duration voltage variations are basically to do with deviations in the voltage magnitude, right? So we have a long duration over voltage. And if it is less than a minute, we call it as a voltage swell. Long duration under voltage. And if it lasts for less than one minute, we call it as a sag. So we saw what characterizes a sag, a swell, and an interruption. Now let's move on to other kinds of voltage disturbances. So this is Professor Umarao from RV College of Engineering, Bangalore, bringing you the e Sikshna lectures on electrical power quality. So in today's session, we will take up the topics of voltage unbalance, or it's also called as imbalance, and waveform distortion. So first, what is voltage unbalance? I think in your power systems, you have studied unbalanced faults and unbalanced loads. What can unbalance do? And you have also seen that unbalanced circuits can be solved using symmetrical components, right? So basically, a voltage unbalance is a variation in a power system in which the voltage magnitudes or phase angle differences between them are not equal in the three phases. So obviously the power quality problem, this particular problem of unbalance will affect only polyphase systems. There is no way you can talk of an unbalance of a single phase system because there is no reference, clear. So in a three phase system, we say an unbalance is present when the three phase voltage magnitudes are not equal or their angles are not 120 degrees. So now this is the quality, the qualification of voltage unbalance. Now I have to quantify it. Quantify means measure. So supposing I give you two, two situations, how do you say the voltage unbalance is better in one or worse in, in the other? How do you come to that? So I need some measurement parameter. So IEEE defines the voltage unbalance as the ratio of negative or zero sequence components to the positive sequence component. So we all know that under balanced conditions, only positive sequence is present. So we have only positive sequence voltages, which cause positive sequence currents only, right? And the presence of unbalance creates negative sequence and zero sequence currents and voltages, of course. And from our system analysis, we know that negative sequence currents have a phase sequence opposite to that of the positive sequence. And zero sequence, all the three zero sequence currents or voltages are in phase. That means the phase angle is zero degrees. And we also know that the zero sequence current flows through the neutral in four wire systems, in four wire systems. So this is just a recap of whatever you have studied in uh, power system analysis so that you will be able to relate to what we are going to discuss here. Now, we normally do not have a perfect balance between all the three phases. See, the system is designed for a perfect balance, but then the loads are dynamic. So I might design a distribution system, for example, for equal loads in all the three phases. And I may connect equal loads also, right? That's called as a connected load. You have studied that. But then what happens is at any given point of time, 
all the loads will not be switched on. So in one phase, you know, more loads may be switched on. In another phase, lesser loads. So this leads to a natural unbalance in the system currents itself. But this deviation is not too much. It's about 2%. The reason being that I have planned my connections for balanced operation. And these, this unbalance is dynamic. This unbalance is dynamic. So such small amount of unbalance actually does not create any uh, uh, issue. Our equipment can withstand it and everything uh, can operate smoothly. But when the voltage unbalance becomes excessive, it can create problems for polyphase motors and also some loads. And uh, equipment like uh, adjustable speed drives, ASDs, they're called, they can become even more sensitive than standard motors, motors which are, uh, you know, started the conventional way. So, though I operate the system with a small amount of unbalance all the time, I should not let the unbalance go above a certain limit where it can damage the equipment. So you just see here, I've just put a plot. I have RYB. If you look at it, the voltage magnitudes of all the three phases are slightly different. Okay. Now, we'll see what are some of the major causes of voltage unbalance. So one of the primary causes is unequal loads between the distribution lines or within the facility. What do you mean by a facility? Say an apartment, an apartment with uh, a thousand uh, houses, an apartment complex with a thousand houses. So roughly around 300 uh, and uh, odd houses are fed from each face. So the load is distributed, the load is distributed. So it is possible that within this facility, right, a majority, let's say majority of the people connected between R and N phase have gone on a holiday. Okay, this is the, this, I'm just giving you an example. This is an example of, you know, where you can have an unequal load distribution uh, within a facility. Or you have an industry. Okay, so the industry may have connected motors for different processes, and maybe some processes are down for maintenance. So it could result in a load unbalance and so on. And I have a feeder and there are, you know, uh, different loads connected and some loads may be off. And so I have an unbalance of voltage or currents in that particular feeder, so on. So this is one of the primary causes for voltage unbalance. And as I said, normally this will not be too heavy unless there is a real emergency contingency, something has happened, some equipment have failed and so on. The second reason of unbalance, so this is from the load side, that is from the customer side. The second cause of unbalance is from the utility side due to malfunctioning equipment. Okay, some capacitor fuse may have blown off. So the capacitor is not connected. The fuse may have blown off in one phase, in one phase. And then open delta regulators, open delta transformers, faults. All your unbalanced faults, like single line to ground fault, double line fault, double line to ground fault, all these can cause unbalanced voltages to be supplied to the customer equipment, to be supplied to the customer equipment. And very severe unbalance can occur because of single facing, because of single facing. So you just see in a transmission, in a line, you know, three phases, due to some reason, due to some fault, one line has become open. Okay, that is called as a single facing. So this can cause more than a 5% um, deviation in unbalance. Okay, so mostly the single facing is caused because of a blown out fuse or an overloading in one phase may just trip that particular line. Okay, then when you have huge motors, like a 5,000 HP motor, a 7,000 HP motor. And if there is any unbalance in the windings, this can also lead to unbalanced voltages and currents. Defective distribution circuits within the facility of an industry 
this can also lead to unbalance. This can also lead to unbalance. Clear? Yeah. So with this discussion, you should see that voltage unbalances, of course, will lead to current unbalances, definitely. There are some causes from the load side and some causes from the utility side. Is there a cause of concern? Yes, there is a cause for concern. The main effect of voltage un unbalance is the motor can get damaged from excessive heat. So it can create a current unbalance of six to 10 times the magnitude of voltage unbalance. So large motors and equipment generators, they are protected by what is called as a negative sequence relay. Possibly you have studied it in your course on protection. So this negative sequence relay will measure the line currents, will measure the line currents, compute the negative sequence component and trip the equipment when the negative sequence component is above a threshold. When the negative sequence component is above the threshold. So we do not let the unbalance affect the motor. The motor is protected against severe unbalance. And negative sequence currents will also produce excessive heat in the motor. It will produce excessive heat in the motor. So the temperature rise of the motor is directly proportional. Okay. So we cannot allow very large negative sequence components, currents in the motor. It will degrade the motor insulation. This heat will degrade the motor insulation and cause permanent damage to the motor. And we are not talking of small chutku, small motors. We are talking of huge drives. So it can lead to heavy losses to the industry. So one definition we saw, the IEEE de definition for current, that is the ratio of the negative sequence or zero sequence current to the fundamental. So normally this is restricted to around 7%. You don't allow more than 7%. Excessive zero sequence current, what will happen? It will flow through the neutral. So it can cause a neutral burnout, a floating neutral. It can result in a floating neutral. Now, voltage unbalance can be measured as follows. A number, I need a number to quantify. As maximum deviation from average voltage, divided by the average voltage. Average voltage means of all the three phases, right? So supposing my voltages are 226, 231, and 233, sorry, 235, I get an average voltage of 230 volts, okay? Then the maximum deviation you find out from the average, and you calculate the voltage unbalance. So it is around 2.16%, 2.16%. So you can find, this measurement is very simple, right? What do I do? I measure the voltages in all the three phases and then uh, take the average, find out what is the deviation and take it as a percentage of the average. So as we saw, the main effect is excessive heat. So motors can be derated to reduce the likelihood of damage. What's the meaning of derating? Derating means you reduce the rating of the motor. For example, or the equipment, transformer. Transformers also are derated. For example, supposing you have a 5000 HP motor. What do you understand from that? You understand that you can load up to 5000 HP. Right? This is under normal operating conditions when you have only positive sequence currents. So when you have unbalance, you reduce this. Don't operate it at 5,000 HP, operate it at something lesser, maybe 1%, 2% lesser. So actually the manufacturer will give a derating schedule or a derating curve along with the equipment. It's a data sheet. So for how much percentage of unbalance, how much should you derate the equipment? Pre predominantly, motors and transformers are derated. Okay. So if derating is fine, derating is fine if this is a temporary phenomenon. However, if you operate a motor for a long time with a derating, 
then you're underutilizing. See a 5,000 HP motor, if you're operating only around 4,700 HP, you know, you're losing out on utilizing the motor to its full potential. So it is not a very good practice in the long term. So this problem of unbalance has to be tackled. Okay. So ANSI standard, yesterday we saw this also when we define under voltage, over voltages, ANSI C84.1 suggests that the electrical supply system should be designed and operated within a maximum voltage unbalance of 3% under no load conditions. Under no load conditions. Clear? So the synopsis of voltage unbalance is the magnitude is typically between 0.5 to 2.5%. It is a steady state problem. It's not transient. It doesn't die down. The source could be either the utility or the facility, meaning the customer. Symptoms are malfunctioning or overheating. Occurrence is medium. It does occur. And you can put some voltage regulators to take care of this. Clear? So this is the power quality issue of unbalance. And if left unattended, it can cost quite a bit. It can be an expensive uh, quality issue. Next, let's move on to waveform distortion. So what do you mean by waveform distortion? Any deviation from an ideal sine wave of power frequency is called as a waveform distortion. So it is obviously it has to do with frequency. So we say it is observed in the spectral content. Spectral content means the frequency content of the wave that is called as a waveform distortion. So primarily there are five types of waveform distortions. One is DC offset, harmonics, interharmonics, notching and noise. So we will just see each one of them and you will deal in detail about harmonics, interharmonics, their causes, effects, everything in the third unit. So right now we will confine ourselves to some definitions predominantly. First is DC offset. DC offset means what? There is a DC component. That's the meaning of a DC offset. So if you take a pure sine wave, the average value is zero. It does not have any DC component. DC means average. Remember that. The word DC means average. Okay. So if you have a pure sine wave, symmetrical sine wave, then the positive and negative halves are exactly equal. So the average is zero. The average is zero, right? Now, if your positive half cycle is slightly greater than the negative, then you have a positive DC offset. And if the negative half cycle is greater, you have a negative DC offset. This predominantly occur because of uh, asymmetry in converters. One of the main reasons is that. So this DC offset is uh, more of an issue where we use uh, converters like in adjustable speed uh, drives and variable frequency drives, etc. Now, if you have a half wave rectification, which, which uh, you are using rectifiers, then this can cause a DC offset. This DC, you know, it is a bias, right? If you remember your basic electronics, so all your transistor biases, they're all DC. You say forward bias, reverse bias, everything, they're all DC. Okay, so this direct current DC component can just take all your electronic equipment biases for a toss. Your bias only will change. Okay, what you're doing, you're having, you, you have designed the circuit for a particular bias condition. And the operating point is predominantly dependent on the bias. So, and you impose a signal and this signal contains a DC component, right? So take even a simple amplifier for that matter. So in an amplifier, you have the biasing, which is completely DC. And then you have the AC signal, which you are amplifying. Now, if this AC signal contains a DC component, your bias itself will change, okay? So it can have detrimental effect. It can cause... Uh, you know, transformer cores to saturate. This can cause a lot of heating and it can reduce the life of the transformer. It can also cause erosion of grounding electrodes and other connectors. So DC offsets are not at all 
desirable. So what do we mean by a DC offset? Just see here. So I have a pure sinusoid. So the average value is zero. Therefore, this has a zero offset voltage. Now you see, if I just shift the wave down, I don't do anything. I just shift it down. This is what I get, negative offset. So if I shift it down, what happens? The positive cycle reduces and the negative cycle increases. I am not changing the wavelength. The time period of one cycle is still the same. I have just shifted the wave down. So if you take the average value, you can see it will be negative. It will be negative. Or look at this one. I have shifted the wave up. So the positive cycle is more than the negative cycle. So this will have a positive offset. Clear? So these are not, you know, desirable because you just think if this is uh, the signal you want to amplify. Now, this has a negative uh, DC. So all your biases will change. Okay. And such offsets, as I told you, can saturate your transformer course, saturate inductor course. So it is not at all desirable. It's not at all desirable. And today it's a problem mainly because of converters. So the firing of the converters, there is a pattern, but if this pattern is slightly disturbed also, you may get asymmetrical uh, outputs, which can cause uh, DC offsets. The second is, this is the first type of waveform distortion. The second type is what are called as harmonics. We have discussed even in some of the earlier sessions, so harmonic is the presence of a multiple of the fundamental frequency or the nominal frequency. So for, for our power signal, it is 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So any multiple of that is called as a harmonic. Basically, we have a fantastic mathematical tool called as Fourier transform. So what this Fourier transform does is any wave, any wave signal, it will split it into some of sinusoids. The wave could be a square wave, the wave could be a, you know, even an impulse, whatever, any type of wave, triangular wave, you name it, half rectified, full rectified, any wave. That's a fit, fantastic contribution. So any wave can be split into some of infinite sinusoids, complex sinusoids. So each frequency is an integer multiple of the fundamental. So the lowest frequency is called as the fundamental frequency in the signal. The lowest frequency in the signal is called as a fundamental frequency. And in our case, it is 50 or 60 hertz. And every frequency has what is called as a Fourier coefficient attached to it. This coefficient is a complex number. Okay, so it will give you the, the magnitude will give you the magnitude of the harmonic content and the phase angle will give you the phase angle with respect to the fundamental, how it is shifted, how it is phase shifted. Clear about harmonics? Now, one of the main causes of harmonics are nonlinear characteristics of loads and devices. Even a simple diode is a nonlinear load. Your rectifiers, converters, they're all nonlinear, right? So this is the major cause for harmonics. So harmonics today has become a major issue in the grid because all our electronic equipment, they all cause harmonics. Now, so I have defined what is an harmonic. Now, how do I, I quantify it? I have to have a threshold. No? So above this, it's not good. Below this, it's acceptable. I need to have a threshold. So possibly you would have studied in your course in power electronics or in your course in basic electronics on amplifiers, etc. We define what is called as a total harmonic distortion. Total harmonic distortion. What does this tell you? This gives you the RMS value of all the harmonics okay, together. 
So you take from the second harmonic up to infinity as a percentage of the fundamental RMS. As a percentage of the fundamental RMS. Of course, Fourier transform tells you it's a sum of infinite sinusoids. I won't take infinite sinusoids. I will put a limit and cut and say any harmonic content where the amplitude is less than very less, I won't consider it. Because mathematics with infinity is not easy. Clear. So now you see here how, how the THD mathematically I write it. Root of V2 square. What is V2 square? V2. V2 is the RMS value of the second harmonic square plus third harmonic square plus fourth harmonic square all under root. So this numerator is nothing but the RMS value of all the harmonics of interest. Of interest. When is it of interest? When its magnitude is significant. If it's too low, it's not of interest. Divided by V1. V1 is the RMS value of the fundamental. The same is the definition for THD of current also. It will be I2 squared plus I3 squared plus I4 squared under root divided by I1. Both voltage and current, they are defined in the same way. Please do not define THD for power. No, it's only for voltage and current, not for power. There is nothing like a harmonic content for power because there's nothing like a sinusoidal power. Clear? Whereas we have a sinusoidal voltage and we have a sinusoidal current. So don't ever make the mistake of defining THD for power. So you just see here, supposing I have a wave like this. I have a wave like this. So this is a reading taken from a meter. So you have spectral meters, spectral analyzers, frequency meters. So this is the maximum value. This is the minimum value. This is the average value. This is the absolute. This is the RMS, crest factor, and form factor. All these are, they, are, they, all, they all will be displayed in the meter itself. Today, you have fantastic digital meters by Fluke, especially, which are very good. Now, your Fourier spectrum would look something like the second figure shown. So I have frequency. I have frequency and I have the current. So it's shown, normally it's shown as a bar graph. So the height of the bar will tell you the relative magnitude. So you can see this is the current spectrum of an adjustable speed drive. So you see some harmonic contents are less and some are more. Okay, just see here, it just uh, shoots up and so on. So you can put a threshold and say beyond this, I'm not interested. They're all very low. So if you have a meter for measurement, it will display the THD. Here it says the THD is 41%. So that means the total harmonic RMS value of the current is 41% of the fundamental. So this is how we measure the harmonics. So when standards have to be developed, the standards will specify what percentage of harmonic is tolerable. So if the harmonic is more than this, it's not acceptable. So we have standards. When we do standards, we will see. We have standards for voltage and we have standards for current. So how much can be tolerated? Now, when it comes to current, I have an issue. What is the issue? We'll see. Just take an equipment. Just take a motor running on no load. Okay. So it is connected to a converter, right? And because of the converter, the current is distorted. It's not a pure sign. Now the harmonic content may be 41%, like here. This, it is 41%. This is the current wave, even if it is lightly loaded. Let's assume it's very lightly loaded. I get the same current and THD will be the same. But the absolute magnitudes will be very less because the load is light. The load is light, the absolute magnitude is less. Are you getting my point? The ratio of harmonics to fundamental is the same irrespective of loading. It doesn't change too much with loading. It's a property of the converter you use. Okay, but the absolute magnitudes itself may be very less. It may be so less that it is not, in, it is not significant. Therefore, when it comes to current, just THD alone is not sufficient. Okay. 
Therefore, the IEEE 519 standard defines one more term called as the total demand distortion. The only difference here is the denominator instead of being the fundamental, because if I take fundamental, the ratio of harmonic to fundamental is the same irrespective of the loads. Here we take the maximum demand load current. Right. So under light load conditions, what happens? The magnitude of the numerator will be small compared to the demand, total maximum demand. Therefore, TDD is an indication of whether you have to bother about the current harmonics or not. For example, supposing I tell you that an equipment is drawing current at a, 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 a THD, a harmonic distortion, total harmonic distortion of 70%. Then you immediately you say, hey, 70%, so high. But then the current, the current is 0.5 amperes. Does it make and the rated current rated current is 50 amperes okay so for a 50 ampere device at 0.5 amperes if there is a distortion is it important i'm just giving you some rough number i mean some arbit numbers just to give you that no because it's too small clear so if i take the percentage of this distortion with respect to the maximum then it'll be very low because the current magnitude is very low Therefore, IEEE standards, 519 standards, also define limits for TDD, total demand distortion. So as a percentage of the maximum demand, what is the distortion? That is also defined. That is also defined. Okay. So I think we are now clear about harmonics. You will study a lot about harmonics in the third unit. In fact, when, it's, it's so important. One whole unit is dedicated to it in this course. Now, the third waveform distortion is interharmonics. So, interharmonics are non integer multiples of the fundamental. So, you have 50 or 60 hertz, non integer, 75 hertz in a 50 hertz system is a non integer multiple. Okay. So, they are found in networks in all voltage of all classes, low voltage, medium voltage, everything. The main source of frequency converters, cycloconverters. Induction furnaces, which are widely used in steel mills and other places, and arcing devices, right? Power line carrier signals also you can consider as an interharmonic because you will be sending communication signal in the power line. In, in one of the sessions, I told you what is PLCC, power line carrier communication. So I use the power lines for communication. So uh, on the power signal, a communication signal is superimposed and it will be demultiplexed at the receiving end, right? So it will be a non-integer multiple that also you can uh, think of it as an interharmonic. So it is not a constant, it doesn't have, or it doesn't appear all the time. It is predominantly dependent on what type of lo loads you have. And uh, these interharmonics can excite some resonant frequencies. And uh, if this resonant frequency coincides with any of the natural frequencies, the resonance can cause havoc. It can cause havoc. Okay. So it has to be avoided. So if you, if you have a arcing uh, device, anything near your computers, it's not good because you know, the interharmonics may spoil your equipment. You have to be careful. So if you look at this figure, right, the 60 hertz uh, signal, I have a window. I have a window. So the 60 hertz signal undergoes two cycles. And the 90 hertz signal undergoes three cycles. Okay. So 90 hertz is one and a half times 60 hertz. It is an interharmonic. It's an interharmonic. Next distortion is notching. So notching is a periodic voltage disturbance caused naturally because of transferring, commutating from one electronic switch to the other. When you commutate current from one phase to the other, naturally this notching occurs. And it occurs continuously. It occurs continuously. 
but we don't treat it as a harmonic problem. Obviously, if you take the FFT of this spectrum, this notching also will appear in the frequency spectrum, but we don't treat it like a harmonic. The notching frequency will be very high because it's a short glitch. It's a short glitch. So the frequency will be much higher than your harmonic, uh, regular harmonic components caused by the converters. Okay. So very difficult for your spectrum analyzers to capture it because the frequency is very high and it cannot be avoided because it's an inherent property of the electronic switches. And when we extensively use converters everywhere in the system, we cannot avoid it. So this is how a notch looks small. It's somewhere in between a transient and a harmonic, somewhere in between a transient and a harmonic. Why? Transient also has high frequency, but it dies down. But this has high frequency, but it doesn't die down. It up, appears continuously because the operation of a converter is continuous. So you see like this. So what is the notch? We, we call this as the notch depth. What is the depth of notch and the duration of the notch? What is the duration of the notch? So these are the two things which are characterized. So you see everywhere you have, I've just put some figures of some converters and they're all available. The notching is there present all the time. The other form of waveform distortion is noise. Now, how do I define noise? Any unwanted signal is noise. Any unwanted signal is noise. Predominantly, the frequency is less than around 200 uh, um, uh, kilohertz. It can be caused by power electronic devices because of uh, interference, because of improper grounding, etc. I told you in, in the previous session that, uh, you know, grounding is considered to be the improper grounding is considered to be the cause of almost 80% power quality problems, right? So we can't classify noise as anything, uh, as harmonic or transients. It's random. Noises are random and they will disturb your electronic devices such as microcomputers, PLCs, etc. And uh, you can reduce the noise by using filters or what are equipment called as line conditioners. You can filter noise. So we saw voltage unbalance. We saw waveform distortions. And in distortion, we had DC offset. We had harmonics interharmonics, notching, and noise. The other disturbance is called as voltage fluctuation. It's also called as flicker. Both mean the same. So here, the deviation is not very high. Like, you know, it, does, it is not a sag or a swell or anything. So you saw anything less than 0.9 per unit causes a sag. It's qualified as a sag. And anything greater than 1.1 per unit is qualified as a swell. So in case of flicker, the voltage is within this boundary, within 0.9 to 1.1, it is within that, but it continuously rapidly changes. It is mainly because of arcing devices and welding equipment. Okay, so here you can't qualify it as a sag, a swell or anything because the voltage is well within the tolerance, but the voltage rapidly changes. So you see this figure is that of an arc furnace. So you can see it is very much within the boundary. Okay, the voltage is 97 point, uh, uh, around less than 98%, 98 to 96%, which is fantastic. It's not a sag at all or a swell, but you can see that the voltage is rapidly varying. Okay, so this flicker is perceptible to the eye. Because, it, because it's within the boundary, you may not notice it in all the equipment, but your eye can do it. I can visualize it. So you'll, you, know, you can observe that flicker. So flicker has, is, is some of the definitions of flicker also have to do with how it affects your vision. So you'll study that again in the uh, third last unit. So the term flicker is derived from the impact of voltage fluctuation as perceived by the human eye. So if it is around six to eight hertz, even as low as a 0.5%, your eye can perceive the changes, okay? So that is about flicker. And the last kind of deviation, you have power frequency deviations. These are steady state deviations. 
So I discussed this also in the previous session. So this deviation occurs whenever there is a mismatch between the active power generation and the active power demand. Whenever there's a mismatch between the active power generation and the active power demand. Okay. And your load frequency controllers in the system will take care of it. Okay. This is directly related to the rotational speed of your generators. We know NS is equal to 120F by P. So P is fixed. So if N changes, frequency also changes. So by correcting N, you can correct the frequency. So the size of the frequency shift and its duration completely depends on the load characteristics and how fast or how slow can your generation control system respond to load changes. So for this, the general procedure is you have frequency, which is measured in terms of speed. So in per unit, nominal speed and nominal frequency both are same values. Okay, but the per unit value of frequency and per unit value of speed both are same. So you sense the speed, whatever deviation is there, you give it to the controller and the controller will suitably increase the speed or decrease the speed. And basically the active power has to be matched with that of the load. So you see here the frequency, if this is for a 60 Hertz signal. So you have two boundaries, the upper boundary and the lower boundary, how it varies. And you have an average value, average value of frequency variation. So the frequency is never perfect in the system. You won't get a flat 50 hertz line, never. If the frequency deviation is more, so frequency is always, you know, where the action is taken at the generation. You can't take a local action for frequency at the distribution end. It is at the generation end because you have to match the active power demand and generation. Okay. So to match this, the generation will be, generator will be continuously acting continuously acting and you have devices to protect the generator. You have an under frequency relay, which will trip the generator when the frequency falls below a particular level. Or you have an over frequency relay, again, which will trip the generator when the frequency rises above a setting. So with this, we will conclude today's session. So we have seen all the voltage disturbances in the last two sessions, starting from short-term voltage variations like sag, swell, and short interruption to long-term voltage variations like under voltage, over voltage, and sustained interruption, voltage unbalance, voltage harmonics, current harmonics, total demand distortion, total harmonic distortion, different waveform distortion, and the flicker, and finally, what is the frequency variation?